Hello everyone, I'm Charlotte, co-creator of The Vov, and on behalf of the entire team, welcome to The Vov's lunchtime tour with Drawing Room. The Vov is a new virtual ecosystem that brings together museums and galleries to present landmark exhibitions for the first time in extended reality. We are thrilled to present our founding 15 arts institutions united for the first time on one virtual ecosystem demonstrating unprecedented solidarity as we embark on this new journey into the digital era where the physical and digital exist closer than ever. For season one, we have invited 15 of the UK's leading museums and public art galleries to revive seminal exhibitions from their archives, revisiting these shows virtually for the first time since their original showcase. We'd like to thank our technology partner, Vortic Art, for facilitating season one of The Vogue for hosting our participating institutions and their bespoke galleries on the Vortic platform. Our lunchtime tour series emulates the format of the curator-led tour that we know and love in the physical realm, replicating it for the first time in a truly digital sense. It is an absolute pleasure and privilege to speak with co-founder Mary Doyle and artist Mark Bauer today, where they will be taking us around the VOV's virtual presentation of Drawing Room's exhibition of Malekta performance. Please note that Zoom slightly reduces the resolution, so feel free to wander around the virtual exhibition yourself after the tour via the link in the chat below. Swiss artist Marc Bauer's Malletre performance is a new body of work commissioned jointly by Drawing Room and De La Vaux Pavilion and was the artist's first solo exhibition in a UK public gallery. The exhibition features the motif of people on boats throughout history from ancient Greece to contemporary media footage all of the works are drawn in graphite and images range from those inspired by 15th century Catholic ex-photo paintings to Theodore Jaricot's The Raft of the Medusa up to Aquarius, the boat that rescued migrants in the Mediterranean Sea in 2018. Marc Bauer studied at the École Supérieure d'Art Visuel in Geneva and the Rijksakademie van Bildende Kunsten in Amsterdam. He is also the recipient of the 2020 Swiss Art Award Prix Mary Oppenheim and 2020 JASAG Art Prize. Mary Doyle is the co-founder and co-director of Drawing Room since 2002. As ever, there will be time for questions at the end, so please do pop these into the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screens and we will get through as many as we can. But for now, I'd like to welcome you warmly to the digital era and hand over to Mary and Mark. Thank you. Thank you very much, Charlotte. Um, firstly, um, it's great to be part of the VOV, so thank you very much for the invitation. Um, and I'd just like to thank Mark particularly for agreeing to um, give a talk about this exhibition that we've revived. Uh, it took place originally at Drawing Room in 2019. And we chose this exhibition um, with a core group of works from the exhibition, from the original exhibition, because um, Mark, through the act of drawing has so powerfully explored the urgent and difficult subject of migrancy and the plight of the individual and in such a, a subtle and discursive way. Um, so thank you, Mark. Um, so your work, just to kick off, your work, you work in a series um, that of, often evolves over several years uh, of research um, into the history of a particular subject. So I just wondered if you could tell us um, what your starting point was for this subject. Yeah, just uh, thank you for, I'm very happy to be here. So thank you for the invitation. Very happy to have this talk with you, Mary. Um, you. Yeah, indeed, the first, um, basically the, the, this body of work starts with, a, because I saw a photo in the newspaper uh, called uh, Le Parisien. It was the in June 2018, and it was a photo that represent uh, some migrant people rescued from a wreck in the Mediterranean Sea by the the boat Aquarius. And um, yeah, if we can zoom now in this uh, body of work there, yeah, exactly. So um, my first encounter with this image, it was that we already saw in the press quite a lot of this motif, uh, people in boat represented uh, as a mass. And, um, and I was wondering why um, 
in a way in this image keep me emotionally in a kind of distance with the with the motif and um, at the same time I was very really attracted by this specific image it's a, it's a photo by Kenny Karpov who is a, a um, photographer based in Detroit and um, this these uh, photos stay in my mind for long and then I decide to maybe yeah I decide uh, we, we see here I cut the image in four four different piece and then I was thinking with a uh, association so for example now you see this group of people on the square drawing and next to it other group of people and I was thinking by doing association of image, I could maybe do an analyze of this different uh, motif that there is in this image. So it works a bit like, um, yeah, it's also a quote of Abby Warburg, the, the mm. German art historian and his idea of Battle's formula that it's actually some motif that go through art history, go through time and um, express more or less the the same kind of essence through different period and different uh, time. Yeah, and like Abby Warburg, he, he was particularly looking at a personal um, history. He created a, his own connections and in a sense that's what you're doing with this particular series of works which you title Index. It, by bringing different, different histories and very sort of fractured uh, things that maybe not you, you wouldn't see an association with. Can you explain um, your associations here perhaps with the moon landing and the Ebola pieces? Yeah, in this, this photo was uh, taken in the night, so the, the sea appears very dark and um, you arrive, it looks from the picture from the newspaper that it was a very hostile, um, yeah, hostile environment. So it's just a boat and um, then it's just this pitch black sea and sky. And I was thinking that this, this uh, density of the blankets really for me, uh, I remember it from this picture from the moon landing and from the space. Mm. So I was thinking and there is also this total isolation in this uh, yeah, kind of non-space uh, environment. Um, so it's in a way quite personal because it's always my own association, but I think that um, it's also sometimes quite obvious, like here it's the association is more like this. That was a, an image I took uh, during the Ebola crisis uh, in Congo and th this protection that the, the people wear. Um, yeah, and it was the same on this rescue boat you see on the left uh, of the, yeah, this image on the left. So I think it's quite um, easy for the viewer to navigate in it and to, to make this difference. Um, yeah, to retrace this, um, this different association together. Yeah, I like the way you keep it very open-ended. It's personal, but it's also up to the viewer how they read these images and which way they read to make up their own mind in, in a sense. Yeah, I try also to have the, um, this image come from very different uh, register or background. I mean, mm. if we take the group of people a bit down, uh, just under this uh, moon landing, you will see, yeah, exactly. So this one with all the little saints, it's a um, fresque in, um, in a church in Romania. Um, there is also in the same group of uh, drawings with this group of people. There is also a film still from the film Metropolis. So it goes from uh, yeah, art history to pop culture to history. So uh, now we see the, just below this, uh, below this one. Yeah, so that's the, the um, Romanian um, monastery and below it it's the deportation of the uh, Jewish people in the Second World War. So you have a, a lot of different um, connection but it's always interesting to see uh, how how this group of people are represented because I think one of the big theme 
uh, of this show was the representation of reality and all this image that we absorb without really uh, nothing it, nothing uh, uh, without noticing it or without consciously being aware of them. And but nevertheless, they they let some trace in a way of thinking and and shape in a way also the the way we behave and our identity. So. I think it's also all a show about images and the reception of images. Shall we move to the Atlas series? Yes. So for the so Atlas, I, yeah. oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> I go ahead. Um, for the Atlas series, what I did, I was trying to um, Still with this image of Aquarius in, in mind, uh, my idea was to reduce the motif to people on boat and to do a kind of atlas of this um, people on boat and see how these people on boat through history, through art history are usually um, represented. And uh, here we have um, a copy of the raft, raft by Jericho, raft of the Medusa by Jericho. And, um, here it was also this, uh, this uh, tragic old wreck and the people had no food. So there was this story that they were eating the corpse. So it was a very dramatic uh, moment. When Jericho painted, it was also a, a contemporary story. It, it appears in the news. There were this, the survivor after the rescue were interviewed. So it was really a kind of... Um, uh, journalist um the topic was very journalistic and then he did uh, something else of course with this motif but what i was quite interested researching through all this image of people on boat is that these people are never really represented in a neutral way they always in a way stigmatized they are uh, here like the jericho painting the original um, these cannibalis, uh, cannibalist people, or they are prisoners, or um, um, enslaved people, or fools. Or, so there is a tradition that actually all these images that we saw uh, uh, in art history or history, it's always this, yeah, this kind of stigmatized people. And I think that seeing this image of uh, Im immigrant people on boat, we in, in consciously, we do the same kind of uh, association. Mm. And you choose to use quite iconic images from art history, in particular, this series, art history. So you have Hokusai is the wave that everybody knows um, with the boat, with the, the sailors um, in the storm. And then moving to the left hand side, there's an interesting piece. Um, based on Delacroix. I forget the title of the work, but... Yeah, it's the, um, um, the, oh, the Bark of Dante. Okay, that's yeah. it. And, um, um, sorry, I couldn't find the, the reference anywhere. But this works actually because you've, you've sort of, this is, um, this shows how you, you source your imagery. So a lot of imagery comes from newspapers, but also the internet and mm -hmm. You've got a record here of the source of the imagery, like the browser that you were using, the time you were viewing it. Can we go a little bit closer in to see that? Can you just explain? Yeah, so why here it was, um, yeah, because um, actually it's um, exactly what you said that this image. Um, lots of, I mean, almost all the image are image that I know very well, also since childhood. Um, I was, as a kid, fascinated by this Jericho and also this Delacroix painting um, for the dramatic story. <laughs> so, um, but here, uh, I, underneath there is a, a um, etching of, um, I think it's an anonymous etching, but it represents uh, the prisoners, um, you know, the, the prisoners during, uh, in the 18th century were sent in France, they were sent to, um, to, the, to the colonies by boat. 
um, urban, yeah, uh, that was called. So they were really sent outside the 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 territory France, and you have also this tradition of this uh, boat that will yeah expels the the prisoners and i put these two images together because actually randomly they appear like that on my um, <laughs> on my computer <laughs> and i was thinking they really work very well together yeah and uh, underneath there is a little i think there is two text because at the same time i was listening to um, french radio to a podcast about this um i think it was um this slavery boat uh, um, and how France was, um, it was about this in the, in the 19th century, 18th century. And then also underneath there is another line and I think, or maybe it's another, it's in another drawing, there is also other line with text and this is the playlist of the music I was listening to. And I think it was for the, um, for the other drawing which is made from the, um, the the boat of the fools by Dürer and the the music I was listening it was uh, electro music by Pirit and it was called sticks and I was thinking these sticks suddenly with this uh, man on boat it, it was also creating new new uh, images but usually I work with very well known images that the viewer no, even if it's not an art specialist or a story specialist, usually it's all images that we, yeah, that we have in a bit in the unconsciousness of, an, of, of our mind. Um, and, and I guess it's a sort of, is it um, a means to sort of question and challenge our, our understanding of, or our notion of history and truth in a way by using these iconic images? Yeah, exactly. you, re you read them in a different way as to you might normally. Yeah, and I think that also the fact that they withdrawn the medium of drawing that is such a slow medium, they also create a distance and a certain sometimes unprecision, even though they look quite precise, but actually this imprecision I always think it's quite interesting to have the, um, the viewer as, um, as active as possible. And mm -hmm. I always think it's quite nice if the viewer has the original or a, a certain uh, emotional memory with the same image and then it can reconnect with it. In, in a way, my drawings are just like triggers to the unconsciousness of the, the viewer. Shall we move to the sea? Yeah. So the sea is an animation. Um, it's done by stop motion and it's um, oil painting, black oil painting on plexiglass. Um, I should say zoom, that uh, in the original exhibition, this was um, out away from the wall. Obviously we have to do it on the wall for the uh, yeah, right. And usually also the original thing goes a bit quicker now it's because the zoom is a bit, um, it gets slower, but you have the link on the Wolf uh, website. So Mark, this was made, as you say, oil paint on plexiglass. Yeah, exactly. It's, so it's yeah, and it's, very um, labor intensive. Yeah, it's quite <laughs> it's quite demanding this work because there is, I think, I don't remember now, but around four hundred or five hundred painting, and for this I usually like to work very intensively, and it's really a kind of. Um, um, a process, I, I like to be totally uh, immersed in this uh, process. So I work 15 hours a day uh, as much as I can and I just focus on that. And it takes me around 10 days. And yeah, I'm just, um, yeah, it's, it, it's really like also a kind of uh, physical experience. 
And it was, it was incredibly powerful experience when you walked into the gallery and the, the soundtrack, which is made of various um, sounds of water, heartbeats, wind, waves, etc., created this incredibly immersive environment um, and really powerful, but it also is very palpable around the idea of the human individual. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The, the soundtrack so of the film was actually in the whole space and was in loop. So you, you see always all this drawing with the, with the sound. Because I was thinking that um, all these images are mainly very old image. You will see also the, the, the ex voto from the 16th century. So it's old, uh, this atlas that we just saw, it's uh, also old. And I was thinking it, it will be nice to have something a bit contemporary, um, something that in a way uh, shake them up uh, and give them a, a different context. Um, because I think the sound, as soon as you listen to a specific sound, you project yourself in this uh, location, in this surrounding. So I work with an artist, Marco, uh, Marceau Pensato, a French artist, and uh, we designed this sound together where you have sometimes sound of water, uh, really like wave, uh, water as if you were in the water, you have also the uh, breathing, a heartbeat, the, the sound of the wind. So sometimes you have the feeling that it's the sound of a kind of landscape, like if you're on a boat in the middle of the, the sea or on the open sea. And sometimes it's more like precise sound of uh, a wave or water or maybe also a motor of a boat or so on. The idea was to really um, put the viewer in this condition of being in, in the open sea. Um, and also one of the theme of this show, of course, is the sea and the fact that still in 2020, this is still very dangerous. Um, and, um, and you are in confrontation with this element that can totally uh, crush you. Um, so there is always this uh, yeah, certain danger when you start a trip in the open sea anyway. Yeah, it created an amazing sort of tension from the static image to the sort of movement and moving image was, was amazing. Shall we move over to the incredibly uh, monumental scale wall drawing that you made? Yeah, so that was a wall drawing. It's <laughs> charcoal and uh, proper charcoal on the wall. Um, so just for viewers, it's about four and a half meters high by seven meters in length. It's difficult to see it in this platform, but it's... Uh... Uh, yeah, so it's indeed quite, <laughs> quite large. <laughs> um, and here I represent a race. Um, so it's a swim race. Um, but of course, in this context, it's, it's perceived very differently with the other image around and also the sound. But I was, since, as I say just before, that all this show is about the images and also the reception of the image, I was interested to put this, um, this image of a swim race in this context. And then, of course, we, we read it in a more a dramatic way. And um, I was also interested to do a bit this, this um, coast. It could be like, it's, yeah, if we look at a bit the architecture from it, it looks like the Mediterranean Sea, it could be like Spain or, or the, some island with touristic facilities. And um, I was thinking it's interesting to have these people in water, but it was with this old project for the old show, it was very difficult sometimes for me to find the right position because, of course, I don't have this experience at all and I don't want to speak for for other people than myself so it was very important for me to find ways to um, to still represent what I wanted but not in this kind of absolute pathos or um, yeah yeah it, it can be easily problematic and I, I think I was very happy with this result because I think that there is a kind of um, 
Yeah, I wanted to have really a respect for this uh, individual uh, experience. But you also, um, the individuals are pretty anonymous, which is referencing the fact that migrants at sea are just a mass of people, the way that we read about them, the numbers killed as opposed to the individuals themselves and who they are. So this sort of really, I think, brings that home, that sort of anonymity of, of the mass of people, um, but also from something that's a, co a competition, you know, from something mm -hmm. that's fun, you're, you're bringing in these quite disturbing um, reference points. But what was incredible, about this wall drawing. I mean, we, we watched Mark make this work over three days, intense three days where you didn't actually take a break except for a cigarette now and again. <laughs> um, and, and it's all done with your hand and charcoal. So all the drawing was using your fingers and the push and pull and the building layers of dark and then pulling it off. And erasure is also an important part of your work, which is figures in the, uh, the first series that we saw where you leave evidence of your, of your hand. Um, yeah. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, I always think that um, I'm always interested that uh, drawing is a gesture um, and it's a gesture of the hand. And what I really like with this wall drawing is also, of course, this physicality. It's, um, it's very physical and I like when it goes fast. So I have to move also fast. <laughs> um, and then there is a lot of erasure. Um, the idea is also to try, I work with um, rubber gloves. And so the same kind of uh, materiality than the eraser. So the idea is also sometimes to kind of push the pigment in the materiality of the wall so that the image is really coming from the wall and it's not on the surface of the wall. There is, a, I, I always like this idea that um, the image come out of the wall and not really, it, it's not this thin pellicle of dust in, on top of it. Um, and I mean, working with this uh, erasure effect um, it also creates different tonality in the black. So there is black that's sometimes a bit warmer, some black that are a bit cooler. And um, I, I, yeah, I really like this kind of um, different vibration, let's say. Um, and, and I'm sure that some people are also very sensitive to it. So it's not just me who is <laughs> crazy maniac about that, but I think that we <laughs> perceive something about this. And, and this, um, the, 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 the fact that it has to go quickly to, to, to draw this, uh, this, uh, this wall drawing, I think it also gave a certain dynamic to the, to the, to the image. And, um, mm. Yeah, a, a certain imagery, and I, mm. I really like that. Yeah, it was it was incredibly um, powerful as you walked in, um, and viewers can look at this in their own time much in, in, sort of better on Zoom. It shudders a little bit. So these are the series ex voto um, works. Mm -hmm. Do you want to? Yeah. So here else? I copied all these exvotos. So exvotos was this um, image um, that was ordered by people who just survived some, uh, some, some um, wreck Seafa in the sea. Seafaring disasters. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And what I was interested in this in these uh, images is that it's always a testimony of this disaster and it's a testimony also of this trauma. So the, the people um, survive and then they ask a painter to, to, to represent the scene and uh, they, they do that to thank the divinity God to, um, to have protect them. So these images are always in a way quite naive and I think it gives a certain authenticity to this, um, to this testimony. And um, the image also functions, of course, as a kind of um, um, protection, but also exorcism. And it's, it's very linked with this, uh, this idea of the trauma. Um, since in the show, I don't have any kind of testimony of, um, 
of uh, the migrant people because I, yeah, as I say before, it, I, I didn't want to talk for themselves. I didn't want to edit uh, also a testimony or the source material that I will have from them. So I was thinking, nevertheless, it's nice to have this image that represent really this, um, when well, this horror of this experience and how dreadful it must, it must be uh, to face this kind of, uh, this kind of event. C can you just explain or talk about why you, I mean, you also um, drew the, sh the frames around the work, but also the way that you position the image on the page? Yeah. yeah, so I draw always the frame because I think the frame um, show also to certain, um, first the taste of the people who, who commented these, these images and also show the certain of a certain preciousity, a certain, a certain wealth that this uh, image have for the people who own this image. So, um, and then I decide to, to put it really down in the, on the page and also have them um, have them always in the same distance from the border. So that was a bit my um, my criteria. So at the end, they have a bit all the same size. There is a so then I have a kind of standard for all this image, and I don't have really to to have one that pop in a uh, pop out uh, or some that are more important than than others. So it's really a standard. And I was thinking, yeah, the show in drawing room was also all the drawing were were um, installed quite low. I did the um, middle of the drawing at 130 instead of 150. So it was quite low and this work, since the motif is already low in the page, it was really low. And uh, I like this idea that you have to bend over a bit to to see if you want to see them carefully, that actually your posture has to change from what you you use to mm. when you look at art. Um, you, you need to do a certain effort. And I think there is a certain um, Humbility, hum, humbility, humbleness <laughs> in this kind of mm. process. Um, so yeah, it was also um, um, yeah, and it sort of brought home the sort of personal back to the yeah. individual, the individual giving thanks for the life of an individual saved. So that there was that real wonderful intimacy when you you look down into the work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Can we move round to? Back to where the wall drawing is to the slope. Yeah. Thank you. So I think it was one of the incredible shocking images uh, during this. Uh, I think it was broadcast by CNN, this um, market of uh, enslaved people in Libya. And, um, and I was thinking that yeah, it's the only portrait of the show also, so it's called Portrait. Um, and for me, it was very important to have this, um, this figure um, because it's, it, there is something surrealistic in this image. And again, it's a, an image that we know very well with this hand that is pointing. Um, that the, the the person is totally out of its reality that this end is, is uh, depicting. And I think it's, for me, it's really the, um, a very alienating image. And, um, and I really wanted to have this image. That's why it's also quite, a, it was a large drawing. It's two meter by 140. Uh, and it's really the biggest, um, except the world drawing, but the biggest drawing on paper of the show. And it brings it back to today because this is just very recent where migrants stuck in Libya are being sold. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then you so, juxtaposed it with a with a, a smaller work going back to a woodcut um, of the slave yeah. ship. If we can see that just to the left. Yeah, exactly. And this uh, this image was published in Arthur's Basel in uh, 
at the end of the 19th uh, century, I don't remember. Um, but it was um, one of the first, um, uh, how do you say? Basically what happened is that uh, these enslaved people were on this boat um, and then the, 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 the chief of the boat, <laughs> sorry, captain, the, captain. the captain <laughs> uh, realized that there was not enough like water for everybody. So they decide to uh, get rid of the enslaved people. So they kill, I don't know, quite, quite a lot, I think 150 or 200. And, um, and then that, that's the, the horrible part of the story. Uh, of course, these people died, but the, the cynicism of this, uh, this uh, slave trade that we sometimes don't remember is that all these enslaved people were insured. So because with the, the trip, there was also some disease and etc. So there was company to, um, to ensure the, the, the wealth of the enslaved people. So even if you would lose uh, one part of that, uh, some, uh, some people would die, etc. The, the, you will still be paid. And that was one of the first, this kind of um, uh, fake insurance um, mm. uh, trade, which is extremely, yeah, just horrible. So I was thinking, it's of course these two stories really goes together, and it's just absolutely shocking that um, that we now in two thousand twenty and it's still happening. And mm. um, yeah, so I keep also this this uh, this text. It was yeah, it was broadcast on CNN. Um, shall we move round to that the last image? I think. Um, now yeah, again, yeah. this work was was presented in a very different way. Like the video was within the space, and this work was on a on a structure that perhaps you'd like to explain why yeah. the structure and then why and what the image is about. Yeah, this work was on a on a statue, a, a tripod, and it was the structure was presenting you the the image in a well at the perfect heights for you to see it. But the, this uh, tripod was quite uh, tall, quite high. And it was a bit like if someone very tall will present you an image. And I wanted to have this image on a different space than all the other drawing, because in a way, of course it's connected, it's connected uh, with this uh, migrant crisis, but it's also, uh, it has nothing to do with boat or sea. It's the, the European Parliament when it's empty, and um, and it was just to have this uh, this this uh, this empty political answer to this crisis. That uh, oh, well, still today, I mean, we still don't have really a kind of um, um, political answer to it. I mean, it's a. Uh, it's an absolute disaster. Even now, maybe more than than two years ago, because now with the pandemic, I mean, this uh, this uh, migrant crisis went a bit in the in the back. So we don't really hear about it. We don't really talk about it. But of course, the the human situation of these people is absolutely dramatic and far worse than what it used to be. Even yes, absolutely. Um... And I think this work brings it home the, the fact that decisions are made for the individual by you know, by a group of whether they're voted in or not, but people who have got no association with um, what's going on really. That they're, they're, the plight of the individual is, is determined by parliament. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And yeah, and this this extreme vulnerability of, of of the body of these uh, migrant people that uh, uh, what can you do if you don't have a, a legal status? I mean, there is no, there is no possibility even to exist. So it's, um, it's an absolute disaster. Mark, could I just ask, because we, we finished showing images, but um, I'm, we're going to probably go to Q&A in a minute. But um, first of all, 
a lot most of your work is is using drawing as we can see it's from small scale large scale animation wall drawings um, and you often incorporate all those uh, elements into into your exhibitions but but why why drawing in particular well i think that uh, drawing is um i i uh, well first i really adore this medium because it's something very um it's something very intimate, something very personal, and something that is quiet. And I think that in this quietness, you can really create a kind of space for yourself to think. And what I also love with drawing is that it's a very phenomenological medium in the sense that you can really show the process of the drawing itself. And that's why very often in my drawing, you see the erasure, you see trace of fingers, you, I don't do sketch. The, 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 the final drawing is the result of this process. So, and I like that the viewer is able to see all the different, uh, yeah, history in a way of this uh, process. So, uh, and I think that to, to, to slow down the pulse of image, the flux of image, it's, it's really something today that is absolutely necessary to experience the image differently and to not be all the time in this kind of constant absorption of, uh, of images. Because at the end, they are very powerful and we should also uh, be a bit careful what we, what we absorb and how we digest it. Thank you both so much. I think we also have a few more questions which we'd love to ask. Um, and I think I'll start with one from the audience who asks, um, part of your practice, as you've just mentioned, is making marks and erasing them. And do you find this method therapeutic as an artist because the piece is always in flux? Yeah, I think that it's, yeah, indeed. I think it's, um, it's, um, it's also a very exciting, uh, exciting process because you know the viewers see always an image, and since it's shown in an institution like like here, so a, a finish or an an, uh, uh, an image that the process is is finished, so it's in a way done. Uh, but my experience with it is very different because for me it's much more like a movie because this image is always changing. It's always um, at some point I stop because I think that everything I wanted to put um, to put in the image and all the elements that the viewer would need to, to read this image is there. But my memory of drawing is not really the image, it's more of a process. So it's always interesting this kind of how duration change the, the, the result in a way. Completely. And I think whilst we're on the subject of technique and medium as well, we have a question um, that asks, with drawing being such a traditional medium, how do you see the potential of technology and digital experience enhancing your practice? Well, I think the, the, the great thing with, uh, with uh, internet and digital uh, reality is that we, we have access to much more uh, images and uh, stories and point of view and perspective as before. Uh, as before, um, you know, I remember when I um, I start uh, also in the art school around two thousand something like this. Internet was not so like it is today, and I used to buy a lot of books. One of my big work was going to library. Uh, or going to second-hand bookshop and trying to find all the image that I was interested in. Um, of course, now internet change radically this, uh, this, uh, this process. And I think it's great that we can see much more. But of course, if you see much more, you also should be more responsible and, and also more aware of, of what you see and how it can affect you. Very interesting. I think um, this question is directed to the one in the back one, the back drawing. Um, and it's asking about whether you consider the choreography of the works um, in terms of where you will exhibit them and when you make them. And do you draw those parallels of 
how you decide which figure goes where, for example, do you draw that in relation to the artworks that this one in particular is shown with? Yeah, so that's, um, yeah, that's, I try to be, well, my, I, I always start, sorry. Um, the way I present this drawing, I always try to make them very comfortable for the viewer because the viewer, it's a work that the viewer has to rebuild and do the connection between the different work. Uh, if you have one work alone, it has not really sense. It doesn't have any meaning. So it's, it's between the connection that this work have together that it creates meaning that the, the viewer will have to read. So I'm trying to be as precise as I can in this kind of choreography and installation. I usually also plan um, quite some time to install every show. So I know that, um, that if there is change, I, I have time also to, to, to redo it. Um, I think that for the drawing room, we changed quite a lot of things from the, from the, because I also work with the floor plan and, um, and I do a kind of a scenography, but very often it changed again in the, when I'm in the space. So I, I like to have this flexibility. That's funny. I remember you coming along with perfect idea. <laughs> <laughs> You're all sorted beforehand. <laughs> But yeah, no, it was it was so good to work with you for that uh, reason. Yeah, maybe so. Then I think it was in Delaware that we it's changed Delaware, a lot. Yeah. yeah, it's Delaware. Yeah, yeah in um, in in drawing room it went really fast. Yeah, but the, even also what we haven't mentioned is the color of the walls, <laughs> which was very right. very particular. You know, the sort of idea of the sea or the dark. It doesn't quite. You don't get quite the color, the tone, but um, it's nearly there. <laughs> Yeah, you're right, because also, yeah, the color, since the drawing are not framed and it's just the white of the paper, we are thinking that they will a bit disappear on the white wall. Um, mm. And this dense uh, blue color that was uh, a bit darker than this one, but really in the same uh, range, let's say, um, give them really a kind of a, a stronger presence. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think we have time for just one more question. Um, and this is around how the depiction, the depiction of migrants, as you say, and that sense of humanity and personhood. Um, and the audience member asks, do the marks and fingerprint or the handprints of the drawing medium, which you've explained, link to emphasizing the need to see the works on a human level? Um. Yeah, I think we can see it like this. Um, of course, yeah, I, yeah, I think we can really see it like this. For me, it was important that a trace of a, there is always a certain reality in the trace of a hand. Um, well, the first hand that we see is probably this Lascaux cave in, uh, in France and this first testimony of uh, humankind. Um, and I think that there is something that is so uh, strong that everybody can relate. If you have the trace of a hand, wherever it is, you, you will automatically know that it's about someone who was there before you and that you can relate with this person. So I think that in this story of this body, this extreme vulnerable body disappearing constantly in the Mediterranean Sea, and we, I think now there is around 10,000 Death, uh, in this sea, um, I think to have the trace of, of, of this existence, of this reality is absolutely uh, primordial. Completely. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and say thank you so much, Mary and Mark, for such an inspiring and moving tour. Thank and you. thank you all very much for joining us today. Um, please sign up to our website to stay up to date with our collateral program. There's lots more to come, just like today, from more lunchtime tours with gallery directors and curators to interactive workshops with artists. And I'd like to take this opportunity to reiterate the Volve's core mission, which is to support our cultural sector during this critical time and beyond. 
by employing a novel microphilanthropic model that pulls together donations from the public and distributes them equally among all the participating institutions, reinforcing our ethos of unity while strengthening the sector as a whole. And there is a link in the chat to take to donate whatever you are able to. It has been such a pleasure to have you all with us today and let's continue the conversation on social at the Bov Art and we look forward to seeing you again soon on the Bov. Thank you both. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. That was really excellent. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> yeah.